have your Bibles uh, open again to the book of Exodus 25. We are uh, coming towards an end to this series in the book of Exodus, looking at the fifth and last message on the tabernacle. The tabernacle. We've seen that it comprised of the, uh, the courtyard, inside the courtyard of the size of about four tennis courts, there was an altar for the making of sacrifices. There was a large basin for the cleansing of the priests. The, uh, the tabernacle or the tent itself had two sections. Had two sections divided by a curtain. There was the, the holy place which had the lampstand, the, uh, the altar for the burning of incense and the bread. And then you had the inner room or the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, in which was the ark or the chest of the covenant. It's been said that if the, the children of Israel had ever wondered if God was with them, if they'd ever had their doubts about whether God was with them after they left Egypt, then they only need to look at the tabernacle. It was a constant physical reminder of his presence. When they moved, God moved with them. The tabernacle has been called the sacred space for the long haul. The sacred space for the long haul. Uh, as believers today, things have moved on. They've moved on. Uh, Jesus Christ, God's son, came he took on human flesh. He was on this earth for 30 or so years. Uh, died on the cross, rose again from the dead bodily. 40 days after he ascended. And when he went up, he did not, he did not leave a t another tabernacle or temple. He gave us the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit, uh, who resides inside the believer, who, who is with us just as really as the tabernacle was with Israel as they went through the wilderness. And he is, he is with us just as really as he was there in the temple in Jerusalem. The abiding presence of God, not in a tent, not hovering over an ark, not in a temple, but in his people. God with us, God localized, the Holy Spirit dwelling within the heart of every believer. And that means that none of us can ever honestly say, I'm all alone. If you're a believer, you can never honestly say, you can never honestly say, you are alone. Uh, certainly we feel loneliness. And sometimes people are distant. Sometimes they're distant. Uh, sometimes we don't get around with each other as much as we would like. Sometimes we don't. But we, but we can never honestly say that we are alone. True loneliness is something that others face who don't have God's grace. That's the truth. That's the truth. A believer always has the presence of God within them. And we need to believe that is true. And we need to act on that. And, uh, and, and take the comfort of God, his abiding presence. And so while sickness can keep people away from church, and other things can, can keep us away from, from God's people, not on purpose, all right? We can know, we can know the presence of the Lord. We can believe that. So this, this Ark of the Covenant, it re really a simple chest. It was a chest. Four by three feet. Four by three feet, like a large sort of coffee table, I suppose. Three feet, three feet high. Overlaid with pure gold inside and out. Purified of all infirmities this chest fit for a king fit for god almighty 
Now, as you, as you read through the Bible, you find that this ark or chest is known for, by a few different titles. There's obviously the Ark of the Covenant. There is the Ark of God, the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Lord God, the Ark of the Testimony, the Holy Ark, the Ark of God's Strength. And of course, when, whenever we think about the Ark, we tend to think of Noah's Ark. We think of a boat. Or we think of the little basket that saved Moses. Beginning of Exodus. While, while uh, the same English word is used, it's, it's, it is a different word here in, in Exodus 25. And it has the idea of a simple chest made of wood covered with gold. There's a few things I want you to see today about this Ark of the Covenant. It was, it was to be untouched by human hands. Untouched by human hands. In fact, even, even the ark itself rested upon four feet to keep it from actually sitting on the ground itself. It had four feet attached. And gold rings were soldered on to the feet two on each side of the ark and, and, and through the rings went the poles that were used on either side to, for the priest to, to carry the ark as it moved. They weren't to touch the ark itself, they were to hold on to the poles. Whenever the children of Israel moved, the priest lifted the poles onto their shoulders and they carried the ark. And friends, you had to be very, very careful. Very, very careful. This, this, was, this was more important than uh, handling the, uh, the fine china at home, the fine glassware. You had to be very, very careful indeed. Even the poles were not to be removed. It might seem like, what's, what's it really matter? Well, it certainly did matter. Only the poles on the ark were, were permanent because... To touch the ark was, in effect, to touch the holiness of God, so to speak. To touch the ark was to die. To die. It was sacred. Not that it was some kind of you know, magical box that you've seen in the movies. Movies made on, on you know, the Ark of the Covenant and Indiana Jones and you know, all, all the wheat, what I grew up on and you know, those sort of things. But God had, had designated this chest, this chest, as the special place of his earthly presence. And no human can safely touch that. No human can safely touch that. I mean, think about the death of, of Uzzah in the, in the time of King David when he decides to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And rather than carrying it properly on their shoulders, the priests had loaded the, the ark onto an ox cart. And a, 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 as the cart sort of moved around, Uzzah reaches out to take hold of it so it doesn't fall on the ground. Well, he had a good intention, but this was disobedience. And the scripture says that God's anger burned against him because of his irreverent act and God struck him down. Just to stop this ark falling onto the ground, yes, because there are no exceptions to God's holiness. <laughs> even, even accidents, even well-meaning intentions. Friends, when someone tries to get to heaven by their good works, that's fatal, eternally. When someone with the best of intentions tries to work their way to heaven and, and tries to enjoy God's presence on their own strength, on their own strength, then that's greatly offensive to a holy God. A holy God. Everything associated with our God is holy. Is holy. His name, his word, how we worship him, we are to treat him with great respect, with great honor. Great honor. That, that, that doesn't change today. 
in fact, the spirit of God dwelling within us. Paul says to the Corinthians that you are now the temple of God. It was the temple that superseded the tent or the tabernacle. You are the temple of a holy God. That's why you have the New Testament commands to embrace holiness. To embrace holiness. Because we might, we might be in danger of grieving God's Holy Spirit who resides within us, who, who sees everything and hears everything we do and say and is there to every conversation and every action, every secret thought. God's Spirit is there. Uh, we, we dare not grieve him. We must confess sin if we grieve him. God's great holiness. Well, this was also a chest that bore the witness of angels. That bore the witness of angels. Uh, you uh, would have come across in the reading the word uh, uh, cherubs. Cherubs, we, or cherubim. We use the word cherubs for newborns, do we not? Cherubs, they're, they're our baby cher They're our cherubs. They're beautiful little angels. Little angels. Don't always remain that way, do they? Maybe the, maybe the girls do. Maybe the little girls do. This chest had golden angels either side of the chest looking toward each other with, 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 with golden wings covering their face. So you had angels either side of the chest. And inside the chest, the copy of the Ten Commandments. Now the cherubim, they're also seraphim in scripture. But there are cherubim, these are, these are special angels. Special angels. They're mentioned almost a hundred times in the word of God. In, in Genesis 3, you have them guarding the way to the tree of life with fiery swords. They're God's security. They remain in God's holy presence to deny anything that is unholy. They have been called the palace guards for the king of kings. Now, God doesn't need angels to protect him. Come on. God doesn't need one angel to protect him, but, but it is fitting for the king of kings to have the, these beautiful angels of glory, these beautiful angels that guard him. And that show us how important and glorious he really is. Uh, for instance, Psalm 99 1 says, God, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Uh, Hezekiah prays in 2 Kings 19 15, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, the angels. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. And so this chest of the angels around them ha has been called at, it's like a 3D image of heaven of heaven the angels around the throne with God's saints as well it's, it's a mixed audience in heaven the, the angels and the redeemed throne of God greater than any earthly gathering Greater than any opening or closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. It's better and greater. In fact, you could put all of those earthly gatherings together and it would not touch what goes on before the throne room of God. Hebrews calls, in Hebrews 9.5, the cherubim of, of glory, the holy presence of God. And this is why the angels lower their gaze looking down on the ark rather than up. They look down. Uh, remember, when Jesus prayed, he could, he could look up to heaven. When we pray, we look down, we close our eyes, we usually bow our heads because we have sin, we, we have needs, we need forgiveness. Only Jesus could look up and pray directly into the eyes of his father. Now let me tell you what was above the cherubim as they looked down on the ark. Let me tell you what was there. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. No idol. No idol. That would have been a false guide. 
between the cherubim was this empty space only to be filled with God's divine and living presence. The place where Moses would meet with God was the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Between the cherubim was glorious presence of God. Let me read Numbers chapter 7. It's actually verse 89. This is a very long chapter. Uh, verse 89 says, When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the, uh, the atonement cover on the Ark of the Testimony, and he spoke with him. This is where God would speak with Moses, no longer on a mountain, Mount Sinai here, around this chest of God. Well, we know that, that above this chest were the angels, two angels. Well, let me tell you what was inside the chest were the Ten Commandments. That's why it's the Ark or the Chest of the Covenant, of the Ten Commandments. They are in duplicate, in duplicate. Why would, why would God even have those in there? Why were these necessary? Because it was the Ten Commandments that set out his expectations of his people. It was the Ten Commandments that, that defined the relationship they would have towards him, towards each other, to complete copies. In effect, you could say that the ta the ta these tables, these commandments, were placed under God's feet. That's the picture. If the top of the ark was God's throne, then within the ark was God's footstool. Now, I'm not just making this up. In Psalm 132, 7 and 8, says, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. It's where Moses deposited the covenant, the Ten Commandments. It is the footstool of God. Now, there, there, there's another reason why these commandments were deposited, were deposited inside the chest. One writer said, it was the custom in the ancient East to deposit, they would place the deeds of a covenant made between human kings in the sanctuaries of the gods, in the footstool of the idols that symbolize the deity. They place the covenants there. So that the Godhead should be a witness to the covenant and see that it was observed. It's about making sure the promise is going to be kept. God wanted them to keep these commandments. This custom makes it clear why the testimony to the covenant made between the Lord and Israel is enshrined inside the ark or the chest. Among the Israelites, there was no image to symbolize the God of Israel, but there was his footstool. There was his footstool. And therein, the testimony or the, or the Ten Commandments were placed and preserved. Thus, the covenant was always remained in God's presence. Jesus in Matthew 5 says that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. So you take, you take the prettiest places on earth that you find, God's foot, that's where God lays his feet. Heaven is his throne. That's where the real beauty begins. That's where the wonderful uh, uh, color and glory of God we're going to see and experience one day. So you had this chest within the commands. The commands. Now let's face it, let's face it. Children of Israel, like ourselves, we're not real good with commands, I've noticed. We don't do too well with, with, with God telling us what to do. We do our own thing. We break God's commands. It takes a lot of effort. In fact, it really takes divine help to keep his commandments. Well, if you have the divine presence and you have the Ten Commandments there, and we know that God's people break the commandments, then you're going to need something else. And listen, there, there was, on the chest, there was a lid, a lid called a mercy seat, called the mercy seat. Friends, what was inside the ark, the Ten Commandments, was their spiritual death sentence. 
the commandments condemn them. The commandments condemn them. All right? What if, what if it was, what if the police could somehow find every person that drove even one kilometre, one kilometre over the speed limit? Just one. Now, our cars, I mean, you know, they're fitted, I guess. It's mainly accurate, the speedo. Mainly accurate within a few kilometres, 10%, whatever it is. But imagine if we got disqualified every time. One kilometre over. Friends, there'd be very, very few uh, of us driving. Very few. Very few. The truth is, friends, we don't keep God's commands as we think we do. We don't. We don't. We need God's mercy. God's mercy. Known as the mercy seat. This, this was a term that found its way into the German Bible by Luther. Mercy seat. Tyndale used the same term as well. The mercy seat. Again, it's not what we sit on. It is a lid the lid that, that is on top of the ark. It has this idea of location, the seat of power. It's where mercy was found. Mercy. This is what we need, God's mercy. If we want his justice, well, that's another thing altogether. Sinners need God's mercy. Now, this mercy seat was only used in effect once a year on the day of atonement once a year once a year the high priest would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat or the lid of the ark of the covenant to make a sacrifice for his own sins and for the sins of the nation and friends when the when the high priest did that every year guess what the nation is covered Atonement has been made <laughs> until next year. Until next year. It had to be done all over again. And so this was a tabernacle that had sacrifices, some daily, some yearly, this national sacrifice. That in, it, I mean, it indicated that a big sacrifice had to take place somehow. How do you bring an end to this? If someone doesn't come and make one offering forever. That doesn't happen. You've got an endless system of sacrifices. And for Jews today, they have no working temple. And so they can't even, be, can't even re reinstitute their sacrifices. The people were covered, covered. Above the ark was God's holiness. Underneath, inside the ark, was was Israel's sin. What is going to come between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man? His mercy comes between that. His mercy comes between that. Not our good works. It's ridiculous. God's mercy. And that's the only thing that will save you, friends. The only thing that will save you. Friends, the mercy of God is the only thing that really motivates Christians. Romans 12, Paul says... By the mercy of God, all the things I've written to you, present your bodies a living sacrifice. What is it that moves believers for the long haul to serve God? God's mercies. It's God's mercies. It's God's goodness. It's not that God's going to slap you around if you disobey him. It's not that you're going to get chastened and then, you know, it's going to be really hard and bad. No, no, no. It's God's mercies that should motivate us. To live for him. That's what keeps us in the race. The wonderful mercies of God. It was a real blessing to meet some old friends from school that I hadn't seen in some 30 years. 30 years. And I've and, and got to tell you that it was, a very, it was a very wonderful, positive experience. But I tell you, there was some, there was, um, so, some friends that, that I met and, 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 and you could see the burdens and cares and, and, and the scars of sin those three decades. 
can see it. What's the difference? For me, it's God's mercy. It's God's mercy. That's the only thing. It's the only thing. That God's mercy, who knows? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Mercy of God, friends. That keeps us close to him. In between God's holiness and our sin must come human, must come God's mercy. This atonement, this at one to be brought near to God, to be united to him through sacrifice, that's what happens at the cross. Parties that were once separated are now one, unified, united. It's God's mercy. It's what Jesus did on the cross. It's what he did on the cross. Think about the tax collector in Luke 18. He's there with the Pharisee praying in the temple precincts and he says, God have mercy to me, a sinner. You know, when you look a bit more closely at that verse, he could have called out, God have mercy on me, the sinner. The sinner. Or you could put it another way, God be mercy seated to me, the sinner. So he's asking. It seems that man had an understanding of how the temple worked. An understanding of how the Ark of the Covenant worked and the mercy seat worked. He said, God, I need the mercy seat. I need your forgiveness. When, God, when someone comes to that place, God gives them mercy. Listen, you want God's mercy and forgiveness, ask him for it. Ask him for it. Humble yourself. Realize that, you know, between you and God, a holy God, not your neighbor, not your friends, not whoever else, but, but it, this is between you and God. And none of us match up to him. None of us come close to his glory. We cry out for mercy. God always says yes. He always says yes when we cry out to him for mercy. Remember the, the Ark of the Covenant made of wood, the humanity of Jesus, it is covered, overlaid with gold, speaks of his deity. The humanity and deity of Jesus, predicted by this wonderful ark, he's now our mercy seat. Romans 3, 1 Peter 2. His bloodshed at Calvary means that the throne of God becomes the throne of grace for believers, friends. And so I want to just challenge you today. Believers, believers, listen, unless we are motivated by God's mercy, it's uphill. Mercy sets us free to serve him because he loved us and he's worthy to be served. He's a wonderful God to serve. Uh, maybe you're here today, you're not a Christian. Friends, you need one thing and it's called the mercy of God. That's all you need. You don't need a better version of yourself. You don't need a, another self, better self-image. You don't need better friends. Right? You don't need a new, you know, healthier lifestyle, as good as that might be. You need God's mercy. It's the only thing you need. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ.